If you are not from the border, perhaps you think that there is a distinct division between Mexico and the United States. But as I have lived in that region where Spanish and English overlap, I can tell you that that is not the case. I'm from the Rio Grande Valley. I was born and raised on a working cattle ranch on the U.S. side of the border. And I married my husband, who was born and raised on a working cattle ranch on the Mexican side of the border in the state of Tamaulipas. And we now live on a working cattle ranch on the U.S. side of the border in the great state of Texas. Although we were raised on opposite sides of the Rio Grande, we often speak about participating in the shared experiences of our binational community. I often muse that a fly could have landed on his lunch table in Reynosa and very easily have made it to the dinner table at my grandparents' house in Edinburgh, Texas. We often speak of our shared experiences of watching the same television shows or listening to the same radio jingles. We both agreed that we really liked the Pink Panther cartoon because the Pink Panther never said anything and it was easily understood in any language. As a food writer, I have spent my career telling the story of Tex-Mex, telling the story of our border food. But when I first began, I started reading all of the great food writers that we are familiar with here in the uni United States. I read MFK Fisher, and James Beard, and Julia Childs, and Fanny Farmer, but our binational cuisine didn't quite fit their mold. So then I started reading about all of the great food writers from the Mexican side of the border, such as Josefina Velasquez de Leon, Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, Bernardino de Sagaún, and of course, there's always El Nuevo Libro de Cocina Mexicana en forma de diccionario. <laughs> but our binational cuisine didn't quite fit their mold either, so I decided in that moment I was going to become the authority on Tex-Mex, but I needed to find a resource that would enable me to tell the story better. And I found one. Mother Nature was the best teacher I ever had regarding cuisine. Nature taught me about our region in ways that people from elsewhere could not. By learning about our native plants and animals, I could see what the aboriginal tribes would have eaten before the conquistadores, the colonialists, and the settlers arrived. By learning about our weather, I could see what types of crops were appropriate for our region. It turns out we're a dry land crop area, and we do much better with uh, sorghum and with cotton and obviously beef cattle. <laughs> our natural environment plays host to airborne yeast and fungi and bacteria, and that in turn had an effect on the way that we store food and what we would find in our pantry. And what we find in our pantry are ingredients, and ingredients turn into recipes, and recipes turn into cuisine. So these are the types of things nature taught me. For instance, how many really great Tex-Mex, traditional Tex-Mex salads have we enjoyed? Not very many. We're meat and cheese people. In the days before we had electricity to pump water and irrigate our crops, we relied solely on rainwater and it takes less rain to raise a cow than it does a salad crop. So these are the types of things that I learned. My brother is an amazing painter. And one day I stopped by his studio to see what he was working on, and I saw this painting, this painting right here. And I was absolutely floored. I was stunned. I was inspired. It's a masterwork. I could not figure out what it was that I liked about this painting so much. I stared at it for hours, studying it, trying to figure out what my connection to this painting was. And I, I finally had to ask my brother, I said, what inspired you to paint this? And he answered me in a very little brotherly way. I don't know. <laughs> well, I didn't know either. 
but I had to figure out what my connection was to this amazing painting of turkey vultures flying in a circle in a deep blue South Texas sky. I know what you're thinking. Turkey vultures are nasty nuisances. Well, nobody likes them. They nourish themselves on the decaying flesh and rotting bones of others. There is not a single piece of protein that is immune to the interest of a hungry vulture. Everybody hates them. Heck, even other birds attack them. Nobody likes them. Turkey vultures are members of the Cathartidae family, which is also known as New World vultures, and they are native to almost every part of the American continent. Now, did you know that a vulture can smell a dead mouse under a pile of leaves over a mile away? They have amazing sensory abilities that help them survive. They do not waste energy. They are caloric cheapskates. At night, we see them roosting in the trees, and they lower their body temperature, so they do not waste energy keeping themselves warm. And in the morning, we see them on top of rooftops and telephone poles with their wings spread open wide like solar panels so they can collect up every drop of that warm morning sun. And as they fly, they don't even flap their wings because that wastes energy. They simply soar along on air currents and mountain updrafts. John James Audubon noticed something very particular about vultures. He said they had amazing memories. He said that if we dared to shoot at a vulture, not only would they remember you, but they would remember the horse you rode in on. <laughs> Humans arrived on the American continent 13,000 years ago by crossing the Bering Strait, the frozen Bering Strait. Now, that theory is debated by archaeologists and anthropologists. But there is no debate and no question who was watching us when we got here. And that's right, my friends, it was the vultures. They have been watching us, and they remember us since time immemorial. They know us well. The people of South and Central America figured out the symbolism of the vulture long before I did. On the Aztec calendar, we have the image of Coxcacuautli, the vulture, who symbolizes wisdom. On the coats of arms, of Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, and Ecuador, we have a New World vulture. We have a New World vulture on the flags of Ecuador and Bolivia. In North America, among the Native American tribes, there are many legends of the vultures. Cherokees call them peace eagles, as vultures do not kill. Sharing our land with vultures is a very large but quiet part of our shared experience here on the American continent. Seeing a vulture links me to everyone on this continent, from the southernmost point of Argentina all the way past the border of Canada. Now, here's some personal trivia. The symbol of our nation, the bald eagle, I've only seen it once in my life. I was in Cincinnati. But every day when I'm at the ranch, when I look up in the sky, I see a vulture. Their presence is part of my everyday life. In South Texas, we don't have a single word to describe what it's like to live in a community that spans both sides of the Rio Grande but we do have the shared experience of human culture. Just as a fence stretches across an open pasture, our human culture traverses our continent. The way that I write about food follows the flight path 
of a vulture. Ignoring and overlooking politics, but highly cognizant of resources. There is no political boundary that is an obstacle for a bird. There is no wall that could be built high enough that could keep out a vulture. The vulture would simply soar over it. Every aspect of our human culture, cuisine, music, art, literature, and dance rises above all that has been constructed artificially. Human culture can and does exist in a plane well above politics. I see this phenomenon every day in my binational community through food, through language, through friendship, through family relationships, and through a deep abiding sense of community. Symbolized by my brother's painting, the spirit of our human culture transcends the borders of our American continent. And no matter what happens in my binational community, I am reminded of our shared experiences every time I look to the sky. Thank you.